Okay, I was into this series in the Gospel of John doing this thing and, and then I ran over and did this evangelism thing and put the pressure on you to write testimonies and you did it and so many of you said, P.S., thank you for this assignment. It was so good for me. And that encourages me too. But I want to go back and pick up for a while in the Gospel of John. Reminder that out of John 20 there is this statement. These miracles are recorded so that you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing in him, you will have life. Your assignment for the week is to read John chapter 5 every day. John chapter 5, because that's where we're going to be. It's one of those great stories of Jesus going to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish religious holidays. They called them feast days. And they were a celebration of the saving acts of God on behalf of the Israelis. And Jesus enjoyed these special worship times. And at this particular one, you know, there were three of them through the year that uh, every adult male within 20 miles of Jerusalem was required to attend legally bound to be there and the Jews had 19 days of national holidays throughout their year in these three two of them were one day celebrations the other one was a seven day celebration those are the three that were required attendance the feast of the Passover when God spared the lives of Israel's firstborn children in Egypt and freed the Hebrews from slavery and the importance of that feast, it's a reminder the people of God of God's deliverance of them from that slavery. And then there was the Feast of Pentecost, at the end of the barley harvest and the beginning of the wheat harvest. If you have trouble remembering which comes first, barley or wheat, then you remember the Feast of Pentecost, and that's the reminder. End of the barley harvest, beginning of the wheat harvest, and it showed joy and thanksgiving over the bountiful harvest. And then finally, the Feast of Tabernacles, a seven-day feast, which celebrated God's protection and guidance in those 40 years in the wilderness. And it renewed Israel's commitment to God and trust in his guidance and his protection. Now, Jesus came down there to attend one of these feasts. And he went in near the sheep gate, it says in John 5, the Bethesda pool was there with five covered platforms surrounding it and crowds of sick folks, lame and blind or with paralyzed limbs, lay on the platforms waiting for a certain movement of the water. For an angel of the Lord came down from time to time and disturbed the water and the first person to step down into it afterwards was healed. Now let me tell you something. Don't get caught up in being overly concerned about how did this whole thing work. If you get concerned about the disturbing of the water and get focused there, you'll miss the point of the story. So easily we do that. Satan has a thousand different traps to get us into when we get into the word. One of them is if you can get us focused on a minor point that really doesn't make a bit of difference. We miss the meaning of the whole thing. And so here these porches are all full of people who are sick, various kinds of ailments, waiting for that water to crank up and one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him and knew how long he had been ill, he asked him a question, would you like to get well? Very interesting that you read this. One of the men was there and Jesus saw him. I want to remind you something. It is consistent with the nature and the work of Jesus to see the individual. Easiest thing that happens to people is you get to where you think you don't count. It was all of us guys down there in Pasadena last week that really counted. We were there with some big stars in the academic stars. No. No. It is consistent with the nature and the work of Jesus Christ to see you individually. Always been important to God. John 3.16, God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that's an individual, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's still the way he operates. And we have watched God operate on behalf of one person in John chapter 3 was Nicodemus. On behalf of one person in John chapter 4 was the woman at the well. One of them so good you'd have thought he wouldn't think he had any need. Another one so bad that she was sure that it was over for her. There was no way she could ever find help. And in the tremendous contrast, we see Jesus doing a one-on-one -on -one ministry. And here we see him again in a place where there are all kinds of people laying around. And Jesus focuses on one man and asks him a kind of a goofy and yet not so goofy question. Would you like to get well? You just think about it. You've been laying on this mat 38 years. Somebody hauls you in there and leaves you there. And then they come back at night and pick you up and haul you back to wherever it is you stay. And here this fellow comes along and says, would you like to get well? Why don't you listen carefully to what I'm about to say because if you don't listen carefully, you'll go out of here misjudging me. Easy for you to be offended by what I'm about to say if you don't hear it all. It is so easy for people to succumb to their illnesses. Stroke hits, partial paralysis. You go through all the rehab there is and, and everything doesn't come back like it should. You can't speak as clearly as you once could. And the use of one side or the other is not full and you kind of shuffle when you walk and the easiest thing to do is decide I'm going to hide. I'm not going to go out in public anymore. I'm going to hide. The kind of thing that happens with people who are having a scramble with alcohol. They hide from help. They run with the crowd that continues to pull them deeper into the mess they're in. And they get lost in the notion there's no help for me. I had a fellow call me just the other day. And, uh, and he, he's a, a man I've had place in his life for years. And he called and he said, uh, I'm ready to admit that I've got a problem with alcohol. I've been praying for this guy. I've talked to him head on about this. We haven't talked for some time. But for him to say, I've got a problem. Tell me who to call. Boy, that's a big step. You're going to stop hiding out. I saw him this morning. I told him, call Jim Maloney. I said, Jim will help you. Put, you. put you on track. Put you in touch with the right people and get you rolling. And I saw him this morning. And anybody that was standing near didn't have any idea of what we were talking about. He just came and shook my hand and said, thank you. That's all he said. I said, did you make connection? He said, thank you. That was it. On the way, stop hiding out. Stop allowing himself to be psychologically and spiritually an invalid. See, that's worse than any physical invalid thing that overtakes you when psychologically and spiritually you become an invalid and you become more and more self-centered and demand more and more sympathy from others. You don't really want help, you want sympathy. And that easily happens to us when we're in that situation of being overwhelmed by things that we can't handle. And this guy looks at Jesus and says, I can't. I've got nobody to help me into the pool at the movement of the water and somebody always gets there ahead of me. It's a dirty deal. Short change. I don't have anybody that will stay here with me. I want to tell you what happens with people who are, whose bodies are twisted up. Most of us find a way to ignore them. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed how you don't know what to do with somebody that's in a wheelchair? Have you noticed that? You, you, you don't know whether to touch them or not? I found great fun in just learning how to go up and put my hand on the shoulder of somebody in a wheelchair and say, hey, pal, how you doing? And they talk to you. Most people are ignoring them. 
Remember one guy buried years ago was in a, in a wheelchair for uh, all of his adult life, was wounded World War II, legs were blown off. They said he wouldn't live long at all. I just buried him a few years ago. He said, I get so tired sitting in this damn chair looking at everybody's belly button. <laughs> See, we don't think about that because we're erect and we walk around hotty with everybody and very mobile. And he was a guy that... Uh, he designed his own house right over here on Moroa and had big wide doors and he could get around in that wheelchair and he lived life to the full. But you see, we forget that if we will treat those people in a proper way, allow them the dignity of being involved in our conversation and have time to talk to them and find out who they are rather than just pass them by because we don't want to get near it's easier to pass by rather than get near and touch them. Here Jesus comes and talks to him, asks him this question. And he gets the response of what I call a permanent loser. We like to avoid people that we think are permanent losers. And we avoid people that have some kind of a handicap very easily. When we as the people of God need to be a part of rescuing them from the psychological and spiritual traps they get into because of the affliction that's overwhelmed them. Hey, one of the, one of the incredible people in this world alive today is a lady by the name of Johnny Erickson Toddy. Paralyzed since she's 17 years old in a wheelchair. Quadriplegic. You've seen her drawing put that stick in her mouth and draws, speaks, is a great representative of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, but beats the drum that we give place to these folks. We allow them to be a part of our lives. And then Jesus has listened to his little statement and then give, Jesus gives him a command and said to him, stand up, roll up your sleeping mat and go on home. And the guy didn't say, I can't. Immediately, instantly, the man was healed, and he rolled up the mat and began walking. Now, I have this mind that says, can you imagine what's going on with all the rest of these people in these five porches laying around waiting for the water to wiggle? The water didn't wiggle, and this guy got healed and picked up his mat and walked out. He's been there 38 years. He's a fixture. They know him. He's not some kind of a con man they've run in there and done this little deal on. He's for real. Man, they're all buzzing. I can hear them saying, Jesus, come over here. Wouldn't you have? If you'd have been there, I would have. If it happened to him, it could happen to me. That picture, boy, I tell you, that I want to see a flick of that someday, of, of just what happened. And as the guy went out there and hit the street, he runs into the Jewish leaders because it was on the Sabbath when this miracle was done. You know, when God set aside the Sabbath, he set it aside for three reasons. One is for rest, one is for worship, and one is for celebration. People, we have something to celebrate. We don't operate on the Sabbath as such. We worship on Sunday, but we have something to celebrate. A part of why people want, I just had a man tell me, he's only been here a half a dozen times. His 40-year-old son has been bringing him to church for the last several weeks. And I saw him out here between services, and he said, I want you to know something. I grew up in a blank church, and he filled in the name. Old line denomination. You read their statement of faith, and it's good. You go into one of their services, and it's bad, because they're a long ways from the book, most of them. He said, I grew up in this church, but I'm going to tell you something. This is exciting to come to church here. You're going to see a whole lot more of me, and I thank my son for bringing me supposed to be the other way around. Dads are supposed to bring their kids. Here's this kid bringing his dad. And the dad having a courage. Got to be in his 60s, the kid's 40, unless he got married at 12, you know, or something like that. At that age, for a dad to say, thanks to my son, I'm here. That's exciting to me. That's the way it's supposed to happen. But a part of it, this is an exciting place to be. I wouldn't trade places, believe me. I was down there with 250 people. I wouldn't trade places with any of those guys to go back and preach this Sunday. 
This is a great place to preach. You people are alive. You people pull it out of a man. You people give a man excitement as he's sharing the good news about Christ. And God set things up so that, that the Sabbath was a day of rest and of worship and of celebration. To rejoice in the good things of God. He wants to be with us. Boy, do you ever get up on a Sunday morning and say, hallelujah, I'm going down to that church house and I'm going to get with a bunch of believers and the Lord's going to be there with it. He's going to come to the meeting and we're going to have a wonderful time and he wants me to be there. You ever see that? It changes a lot. You know, your wife saying, you ought to go to church, you old buzzard. You ever get in the notion, God wants to be here and worship with you. It makes a lot of difference in how you feel about things. Well, that day had been changed by a lot of legal stuff. It had become a very dreary, regulated time. There was no joy on the Sabbath. And a part of the rules, listen to this, a part of the rules, if you were to carry anything from a public place, which is what this pool was, to a private home, you were to be stoned with rocks until you were dead. That was their law they had set up. When they stoned you, they didn't just throw a little rock or two at you. They threw rocks at you until you were laying underneath this heap of rocks and you were dead. That was their rules. And here is this guy, 38 years, he'd been laying around, twisted up like a pretzel. Suddenly the guy is, rolls up his mat, heads out down the street and runs into these people. And they say to him who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. It's illegal to carry that sleeping mat. You got to be kidding. And the man made one statement. The man who healed me told me to. See, he went to a higher authority. The man who healed me told me to carry my mat. And a part of the, the thing you have to, to see is that these fellows, these Jewish religious leaders, they could not rejoice in what was going on here because all their man-made laws were going to smash because of what had happened. See, if you ever see that, then you get a better picture of what's going on. If they buy it, if they'd have said, Herkimer, you're healed. Hallelujah, and it's great. So it's on the Sabbath day. Who gives a rip? Man, it's wonderful. They couldn't do it. They've got to be into the law. Some of you had a good week this week because you did your assignment. 3.30 in the afternoon, you found something to laugh about. That's what you're supposed to do every day. huh? You found something to be foolish about somewhere. People looked at you this week and worried about you a little bit. And especially they worried when you said, my pastor told me to do this. They were really worried then. Some of them may sneak into church today or next week or at Easter when you invite them to say, what is this all about? Christians having a great time. Okay to have a little fun. You see, when, when the legalists get hold of anything, they kill it. And here is this poor guy. He's just gotten healed from 38 years of being all twisted up and he's walking down the street and they suddenly say, you can't do that on the Sabbath day. And he's thinking, dear God in heaven, now I'm going to be stoned. They're going to kill me now. I just got fixed. <laughs> now that's a big dilemma in the guy's mind. And he was smart enough with the answer. Of the man who healed me told me to. And they said, who said such a thing? And he said, I don't know. And Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. And afterwards, Jesus found this man in the temple. What a great deal. The guy had enough sense to say, I'm going to go and worship God and thank God for my healing. And Jesus found him, talked to him for a minute, said to him, now you're well, don't sin as you did before, or something even worse may happen to you. And the man went to find the Jewish leaders and told them it was Jesus who had healed him. And they began harassing Jesus as a Sabbath breaker. And Jesus said this. My father constantly does good and I'm following his example. See, the question here is the issue of authority. Who's in charge? Are these religious leaders in charge with all their rules? Or is God in charge in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, who has come and made this declaration that he is the Messiah, he is the son of God, he is the savior of the world. Jesus says, my father constantly, 
is doing work. My father turns the sun on every day and lets it shine. Even on the Sabbath, he lets it work. The rivers flow even on the Sabbath. Birth occurs even on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, my father's constantly at work and I just do what he does. Now let me tell you another reason why these, these uh, religious folks here couldn't rejoice in what had happened to this fella. The rabbis taught those people that sin and suffering were inevitably connected. We still have some people like that hanging around today. Oh, you're sick. What have you done wrong? You had a major problem in your family. What did you do wrong? Someone was killed in your family. What did you do wrong? And they put us under a load of guilt. See, if you don't know that, when you read the book of Job, it doesn't make any sense to you. Because here are these three friends of Job, and they show up, and Job, all ten of his kids have died. All of his animals have died. Everything he owns is gone except that miserable wife. And these guys sit with him, and what do they say to him? Okay, Job, what have you done in your sin? I have not sinned. Oh, yes, you have. Because sin and suffering were always hooked together in the minds of those people because their religious leaders taught them. And if a man suffered, you knew he had sinned. And he would not... And he could not be cured until his sins were forgiven. Now get this picture. Here's this guy 38 years laying there. He's got his mat walking out. What's happened? His sins have been forgiven. And if the Jewish leaders jump up and say, Hallelujah, this is marvelous. They are saying that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. And they're not about to say that because if they do that, they are acknowledging he is truly who he said he was, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. They don't want to say that. Because they lose their job. They lose their place. They lose their power. And people, the issue of authority has always been an issue and it still is to this day. We struggle with that in our lives. We come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, but we struggle with putting him in the Lordship place in our lives because if we do that, we acknowledge that he is an authority and we don't want to let anybody else make decisions. We want to make those decisions. Some of you that are outside of Jesus Christ, you have, you've not yet come to the Savior. The whole issue is the issue of authority. And you are unwilling to say, I need a Savior. I will acknowledge my sins and re receive forgiveness from the Lord. From this Christ who lived a perfect life and died in my place and rose again from the dead. I cannot bring myself to acknowledge my sin because somehow that tears up my image of who I am. Friend, you are a sinner. You are separated from God. And unless you come by way of Jesus Christ, the supreme authority. You see, Jesus goes on to say, I want to read a couple of things. I'll let you go. See, his identity with the Father, listen to the reading of this. My Father constantly does good, and I'm following his example. And Jesus said, the Son, of, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing, and in the same way. For the Father loves the Son and tells him everything he is doing, and the Son will do far more awesome miracles than this man's healing. What is that? That's us giving us eternal life, eternal salvation. What he did for that man was for a moment. Maybe the guy lived 10, 15, 20 years beyond that. And it was great, but then he died. You see, that salvation that cares about eternity and gives us a place in the family of God for all of eternity, that's the incredible gift that God brings to us through Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, Jesus talking, he will even raise the dead from the dead, anyone he wants to, just as the Father does. And the father leaves all judgment of sin to his son so that everyone will honor the son just as they honor the father. But if you refuse to honor God's son whom he sent to you, then you certainly are not honoring the father. I say emphatically that anyone who listens to my message, what was his message? That he had been sent to the father to take away the sin of the world. 
Anyone who listens to my message and believes in God who sent me has eternal life and will never be damned for his sins, but has already passed out of death into life. And I solemnly declare that the time is coming, in fact it's here, when the dead shall hear my voice. He hadn't yet raised Lazarus, that's coming right down the road. The voice of the Son of God and those who listen shall live, and the Father has life in itself and has granted his Son to have life in himself and to judge the sins of all mankind because he is the Son of Man. Don't be surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves shall hear the voice of God's Son and shall rise again those who have done good to eternal life and those who have continued in evil to judgment. See, you think about him saying this, and you think that sometime later, just down the road, two, three miles out of town was where Bethany was. That's where he raised Lazarus. That's why he specifically, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, he just didn't say, come forth. Everybody would have jumped out. He said, Lazarus, come forth. He was calling forth the dead, and he only called one fella because he only called one name. Whole graveyard had been a mess if he'd have called, just come forth. That's another message. But it's just the idea. See, we need to think about, is our source of authority and power God the Father through Jesus Christ? What is your source of authority? Well, I've got money. I've got position. I've got this. You've got all the stuff that will pass away. Okay? A lot of you think if you had money, you'd really be something. No, you wouldn't. You'd just be rich. Doesn't make you anything except rich. You'd have the worry of that money. You'd get the paper every day and see how the stock market's doing. Some of us never read that page. Why? We have no investment there. It really doesn't bug me about what happens. Personally, I have friends I get concerned about, stockbrokers who come to Bible study on Thursday morning. And sometimes they all leave at the crack of dawn. I mean, as soon as they can get out of there because the market's open, they've got to find out what's happening. But I salute those guys in a very special way. They come and take some time out of a work day to study the Word of God. You see, when, when you understand this, your source of authority and power must be God the Father, and you only get there through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus' identity with God the Father was based on complete obedience, not partial, complete obedience, which is based on love, not based on submission to power. See, we understand something about things that are based on submission to power. You leave here and you're rushing home because you want to get tuned into the Daytona 500, okay? And for that little period of time, you're barreling down West Avenue and you think you're in the Daytona 500. And suddenly you look up in your rear view mirror and there are all these lights going off and you say, oh no. You don't pull over and say, oh, I am uh, going to live in obedience based on my love of the government. You know that man has a pistol. And you submit to power. He's got a badge, he's got a pistol, and he's going to pull you over and write you a ticket for second place in a race, and it's going to cost you real money. The whole different system when we come to a place of understanding the authority of Jesus daily in our lives. He is the giver of life, he's the bringer of life, he's the receiver of all of the honor, and we have the privilege to be hooked into him. One question. Have you acknowledged the authority of Jesus Christ? Do you, as a believer, take time every day to acknowledge the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life? And if not, your Christian life doesn't measure up like it should at all. It's a struggle. It's a scramble. Because always you're wrestling to see who's going to be in charge. The way of joy in the Christian life is to learn to allow him to be in charge of his property. That's you and that body and that mind that you have. And allow God, allow God to have the authority through his son Jesus Christ in your life and find the delight that comes from that. Father, we deal in a, in a subject that 
in the flesh, we don't want to hear because we want to be the final authority. Nobody's going to tell me how to do anything. And even when we come to you, Father, we want to look at your grace and your mercy and we don't want to look at the fact that we will stand accountable before you someday. My prayer is twofold. For those worshiping here today as best they can, but having never yet acknowledged the Lord Jesus Christ as the supreme authority in their lives. I pray that today would be a day where they would say, help me. I need to make a move toward God. Help me. And secondly, I pray for believers in this place who have acknowledged Jesus Christ as Savior and received his salvation but struggle with the Lordship, struggle with the authority. Need to be some great moves made by people in this congregation to willfully grant the authority to the Lord God of heaven. So bless us, Father, as we wrestle with those issues. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.